Welcome, more gamers, to the wild, war-filled Mortal Realms as we cover a story pulled straight from the Sons of Behemoth Battle Tome, which I don't cover a ton of, and this story is known as The Heads of Arbalester. The mystery of the stone heads of Arbalester, considered one of the wonders of the realms, is finally solved as the Necroquake breaks across Arbalester Island. The curse of petrification that created them, the legacy of Archmage Teclas, and the mountain-dwelling elf seers that buried the unfortunate Gargants neck deep with their spells of entombment, is finally broken. The enormous, rocky heads turn back to flesh, roaring and bellowing in anger at the bone-splitter oryx making camp around them. Over three months of hard digging, the chanting oryx tribes dig out the buried mega-gargants. It costs them as many 50 boars a week to keep the gargants alive, and the bellows from the immense gargants is consistent and obscene enough to offend even the oryx. Yet the Wurgog prophets insist the once stone gargans are Gorkamorka's children come to life. They keep the faith, and the towering gargans of Arbaluster are freed. With a tribe of war-painted behemoths bent on carnage at the heart of their clan, the Greenskin's next war proves unstoppable. Dozens of stone outcrops are carved in the likeness of the Arbaluster gargans, many of which are brought to life by the shaman's spells. They take over not only the human-settled uh, North Tail Island, but are also the entire archipelago of the Underworlds to the east of the Asia Empire. So holy smokes, there's a lot of cool information there. Let's break this down just a bit here. Uh, first off, the name Arbalist, if you didn't know, uh, so the island is called Arbalester Island. And Arbalist is an old school kind of crossbow, which kind of threw me off a bit. It's not what I was expecting when I saw the title of the story, uh, because... I'm sure that many of you are furiously typing all of that information out in a comment, and uh, if you're a history nerd like me, I see you. Game respects game. But I love this story because uh, it's in the Sons of Behemoth battle tome, but I feel like the core idea of this whole story is, hey, what if bone splitters got everything they ever wanted, right? Like, what if they were just absolutely spoiled? And so let's unpack it. Way back in the Age of Myth, I'm, I'm guessing, there was a bunch of Mega Gargants running amok, and Dintekla shows up with uh, what we now know to be uh, stone mages, and is just like, nah, dude, we can't have this, and he turns them into stone. Okay, they must have been frozen for some time, they're considered a wonder of the realms, like a natural, you know, in crazy happenstance that's formed. Um, Teclas turns them into stone, and then the stone mages, like, basically have a landslide come and bury them up to their necks. And like I said, I'm assuming this happened a long time ago because there would have been time for people to, you know, revel at this marvel of the realms and it became a known thing. And then the Bone Splitter tribes moved in and saw these heads as like idols of Gorka Morka, which makes perfect sense, right? I mean, they these guys are looking for the spirit of Gorka Morka in everything. A, a perfectly sculpted head of a mega gargant out in the middle of nowhere does seem strange and magical, like it's portentous in some way. And I like to imagine this, you know, this Bone Splitter War Clan building these, you know, huge stone heads into their mythos. And that's that's something that all destruction factions do. They look at their natural environment, they say they see how wild and raging the nature is, and they build it into their mythos for how they worship Gorkamorka. So like, you know, do they make offerings to the heads? Do, does the prophet claim to be able to speak to them? You know, that all of these huge heads are like whispering to him. Um, I'd love it if they adorned themselves with tattoos and trinkets and skulls like anything that's like reminiscent of a head i think that would be so stinking funny again not that they're worshiping them as gorkomorka but they're building these things that they see as uh, references to him into their mythos into their tribal traditions and folklore that they would teach other orcs and spread the message now whatever you know their religious you know way of bringing these statue heads into their religion is um can you even imagine seeing what they saw okay because to kind of put the scene together remember this happens during the necroquake when all this magic is reversed so the sky goes dark the sky not only goes dark but it's like tons of storms reality starts to heave and twist because the necroquake just devastated the realms keep in mind this is happening in 
uh, Shaiish that says that they're near Asia, which is like right next to the line where the Shaiish Nadir starts sucking in reality. So like these guys are at the epicenter of all of this craziness. Um, the world around them is warping and changing and breaking fundamentally. And then all of a sudden they're seeing their idols literally come to life and there's just death magic pouring all around them. The natural order of the realms is convulsing with Nagash's schemes. Um, they have ghosts and zombies are popping up everywhere, endless spells. And then this statue that is the icon of your worship and the defining feature of your home. I mean, you know, whether or not they, they built it into their clan lore uh, or not, they built their camp around it. So it's at least part of their home. It starts like wrinkling its nose up, right? If he wakes up, anything like me there was at least an hour of unintelligible grumbling but he's so far beneath the earth i bet like the ground was shaking and vibrating with them just like yelling and grumbling and being angry about their captivity and like i said earlier if you're one of these bone splitters literally all your dreams just came true okay you're beseeching an icon of gorka for purpose direction um probably asking like hey where's the next fight which direction should we head you know all these kinds of things that orcs are want to do specifically bone splitters are want to do uh, hunting big beasts and all these kinds of things a storm sweeps in it brings a ton of enemies to fight night haunt undead all this stuff and then the icon of your worship comes to life and he's like, all right, let's go wreck somebody's day. And so the bone splitters set to digging them out. Now, uh, we don't know how many there actually were amongst these, the, the heads of our ballister, but uh, we know there are at least more than one, obviously, because it's pluralized and it took them three months to dig them out. So that is an insane amount of time. And they're like giving up resources to do this, obviously feeding them boars. Now, what I love about this story is like after all this effort and, and this kind of thing, like they just become unstoppable, right? They paint up the mega gargants in the bone splitter colors, which you should totally do on the tabletop uh, if, if you have the ability to. I mean, there's no reason not to. That sounds so cool. And they march to war like no other. And I have a few things that I want to chat about because there's a lot of implications for this that I want to see in other factions. I'm going to do that right after a quick word from today's sponsor. Hey Wargamers, Doug here, and I have something to improve your hobby no matter what game you play. The Level Up is a game table system designed to raise and increase your gaming space in an easy and efficient way. You don't have to buy a $5,000 mega uber gaming table of excellence kind of a thing. Because the Level Up uses a system of interlocking tiles raised up six inches by stainless steel non-slip legs. And because of the different options you have on where you put those leg mounts in, you can actually increase the size of your gaming surface. So here's what I mean. My dining room table is a 42 inch wide circle. However, I took the skirmish variant of the level up and I was able to turn that into a perfect three foot by four foot gaming table. And there are actually five sizes that this system supports. Now, in addition to having the very common, you know, sizes of boards that we would play on, as I said before, the level up raises your uh, gaming space up six inches. And if you're tall like me at 6'3", uh, it's a blessing for your back. In addition, each copy of your level up, no matter what size you get, comes with these really nifty clips. So if you do put, say, a DD and d map or, of course, your neoprene gaming mat that a lot of us use in this hobby, you can clip it and secure it there so there's no sliding around whatsoever. But what's interesting is that even if you already have your own six foot by four foot table, the fact that it's now raised up means you can use the real estate underneath your table. So you're actually gaining room for all of your reference material, your measuring stuff, where uh, dead units can go. All those kinds of things fit really well underneath there. And so I even put a battle tome sideways so you can see just how much room there is. The level up crushed its Kickstarter doing exceptionally well. And now that product is fully hitting the market, all funded and ready to go. So if you would like one, go ahead and check it out in the link down below. Now back to the video. All right. So why is this so cool? Again, it's the tale of bone splitters getting everything they ever wanted, but it's also a great depiction of how the Age of Sigmar environment and destruction factions all come together. See, Gargants turned to stone has nothing to do with bone splitters, right? I mean, they're just, it just it was an event that happened in history and people have just realized, hey, there's some really cool statue heads out there. Like it means nothing to them. 
But the Bone Splitters are a kind of orc looking for the fingerprint of Gorkamorka in everything, whether it's you know jagged peaks of frozen mountains like the Icebone Clans to the deep valleys of Gur uh, that they think you know Gorkamorka's toenail scraped into the earth, and that's an actual thing from the Romge Wars. It's the best thing ever. And when these elements combine, you get a religious zealot faction intermingled with another race that they view as idols, and it's just incredible for that reason. They go together perfectly, but the two have no actual relation outside of they just happen to be in the same place. And this relationship that they form is mutual in the extreme, right? The Gargans need food and they need help by being dug out. And the Bone Splitters see their faith as being rewarded, right? Their excitement booms. And for Oryx, excitement is tangible, right? We call it wah energy which I'm sure was booming all the time. You can see my video on, on the wall for if you are curious about it, but essentially the bone splitters free the Gargans and then go carve their own stone heads, which the shaman brings to life. Now that is a one throwaway line that is really, really big because essentially uh, I think they're just making rogue idols of Gork and Mork right now, which is the coolest thing ever. That There's so much power and intensity wrapped up in this event and in this possibly small or large, doesn't matter, war clan, it has a meteoric rise in power because not only are they gaining, first of all, like a bunch of Mega Gargants into their army, which are in the lore are just like unstoppable living machines of destruction, but then the excitement and the enthusiasm from that act, from seeing their faith rewarded from their perspective, from seeing their idols of Gork and Mork, you know, of Gork and Morka come to life, they can then take that tangible energy and put it into something else that they make more things. They make rogue idols of Gork and rogue idols of Mork, and they just, it, it just kind of is a machine that feeds upon itself. It just kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's exactly what is so cool about destruction armies. No other grand alliance, in a way, has these kinds of mutual relationships that just feed into themselves and get bigger, and they're able to swing above their weight class and magnify in the same way. And in that last paragraph, I want to highlight this, we learned some very important details about this whole narrative. Like I said, it takes place in Shayish, the realm of death, extremely close to the Necroquake. Wherever this is, it's just east of uh, Asia, which is very close to the Shayish Nadir, which immediately raises the question, where are they headed? Right? I mean, the Mega Gargants uh, seem to need an immense amount of food, and Shayish is very barren. So, what once was the prime inner lands of Shayish, where everything was stable and calm, and there was probably food aplenty, and that's why Mega Gargants were there. Nagash flipped that script with the Shayish Nadir, and now it's the most hostile place. So now, where are they going to go? And that's just a very interesting question to me. Because I can absolutely see this initial wave of violence that the, the Bone Splitters and Mega Gargants are doing turning into a campaign of hunger. Right, the Mega Gargants leading the War Clan around looking for food, and the War Clan thinking their idols are marching to war constantly, which, in a way, they are, uh, or just follow along. And this could easily establish one of those mutual relationships between factions that I love to cover. Right, different armies with different views and beliefs forming symbiotic relationships in a crazy setting. And that, to me, really exemplifies like why the switch from Fantasy Battles to Age of Sigmar happened, where it's like, a lot of times in the old world, sometimes I felt like, why would these two factions ever interact? Here, we have like just the sheer scale and the crazy amount of history and the vastly different worldviews and values and all these kinds of things of these factions pool together and these incredible stories happen of these weird symbiotic relationships and just tearing up an enemy. And it's for stories like this that I love the idea of the Necroquake. Honestly, um, the Necroquake itself wasn't that big of a deal to me in terms of like setting stuff, but the idea of having a singular event that affected every faction, you know, whether they made it a destruction thing or a, a chaos thing, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. Having a singular event that affects the entire setting is a wonderful idea. And I know at the time of writing this, the main narrative is moving away from the Necroquake into whatever the Broken Realm series is going to end with. But setting wide events are fantastic for stories exactly like this, right? It's a, it's a nudge or an impetus for smaller stories to develop that are a direct result of the main narrative, meaning they add 
um, importance and significance to the main story that the Necroquake happened, but they're not tied to it, right? Like, this is not a story that is dependent upon knowing all the crazy lore out there that's happened with Nagash and the rise of kings and Tekla smiting him down. All You know, it doesn't matter. This is just a side effect, but it's a compelling story that shows you that the Necroquake had significance, that these setting-wide things are affecting even these tiny little narratives all over the place. And that's why, you know, when I follow the main story arc for Age of Sigmar as a setting, you know, all these little stories that dot in there and kind of slide into that timeline are super important because they make the main story seem more interesting, but they also aren't dependent on it. They're, they can be standalone stories that are hyper interesting or fascinating or, or just funny, quite frankly, all this kinds of stuff. And it makes me wonder how many of these kinds of stories were created from other setting wide events. For example, Marathi attaining godhood. Right, Teclas undoing the Necroquake in Broken Realms Teclas, um, Bellicor's rolling cloud of chaos that is seeping into the realms. How many of like those events have acted as the spark that set off tiny narratives like this, where it's like, you know, any human villages that got destroyed by this Bone Splitters and Mega Gargan War Clan combination. They didn't have anything to do with the Necroquake. They didn't have anything to do with it. But like the spark that set off the domino effect, I should say rather, of like, you know, the Necroquake unleashing these Mega Gargans, Bone Splitters digging them up and seeing them as idols. It just created chaos and devastation for the people living anywhere around them. It's just fallout. What kind of fallout was created from these other huge setting wide events? I just, I love it. That's my favorite thing. So anyway, friends, I would love to know your thoughts. Are you going to paint up your Mega Gargant to match your Bone Splitters? If so, how can you not do some cool tattoos, right? I mean, let's be honest. That's what the Bone Splitters are all about. Um, so let me know in the comments down below what you think of this story, uh, how you would like to see it play out. Uh, I, I'm absolutely excited to read it because, again, this is just one where it just makes me smile. Like, I just like these stories quite a bit. So let me know, and I'll catch you there, and happy wargaming.